Hello and welcome back to the worst War Machine channel on the internet. I'm Malorian and this is Malorian Weekly. Now I gotta say, I did not plan for this topic today. I was gonna be covering something completely different, but then I went down for weekly gaming, had a chat with a returning player, and I was like, you know what? This is a much better topic for right now. So what we're gonna be talking about is themes. And the reason why we're talking about this is that, hey, let's be honest, it's something that's been a discussion ever since Mark III came out. Are these themes good? Were they better in Mark II? But now that we're in a spot that there's been a lot of developers changing in Privateer Press, Maybe Mark IV is on the horizon, we don't know. The, the idea of themes and what it should be is kind of back on people's minds again. So I thought it'd be good to cover in this way. One, we're going to be talking about Mark I. No, scratch that. We're not going to do that because I didn't play Mark I. I have no idea how the themes worked. And it was such a different game, I don't think it really applies to what we have right now. I mean... Man, we didn't even have battle engines during... I don't even know if we, when did those come into Mark II at some point, right? Like, Mark I was a very different game. So we're going to forget that. Mark II. We're going to look at the theme list that we had in Mark II. We're going to look at the theme list that we had in Mark III. For each of those, we're going to kind of talk about, just very quickly, what was the good and what was the bad. Then we're going to pump the brakes and we're going to say wait a second, why do we have themes at all? What are they trying to achieve? And what are some metrics for success? So we know that what we're actually trying to do with these themes. And then we're going to go back to those Mark II and Mark III themes. We're going to figure out and grade them to kind of see where they sit. And then learning from those, we're going to go forward and say, well, what should we do going to Mark IV? Now, before I do this, I have recorded this five times and it's so hot right now and I'm burning up, I keep on coughing. So I got my water this time. I am not reshooting this. <laughs> I've done, been doing this for an hour and I can't get through it. So if I cough, I'm sorry, but this is just happening now. I'm running out of time. So let's do this. We're going to jump back to Mark II. And what did themes look like back then? Well, what they looked like were something very different than what we had now. For starters, you wouldn't start with something like, oh, Sons of the Tempest, or oh, you know, Grave Diggers, because we're doing trenchers. No, we would be going to the caster. And because the reason is that we actually had stories and books back then, and from that, well, look, we have striker that's going out there and fighting there with this army oh we have Kane that's going out there and using this army and so looking at this caster and the army they had well then you'd have a caster you'd have some requirements of what was allowed right you could be having these jacks these units these solos so sounds kind of the same as now except only that one caster and then we got to the tiers. This is where things were super different. So you could just go and, and take things from, from this list and there you go. But if you wanted to get extra bonuses on top of that, you'd want to go through these tiers. And you had to go through them sequentially. You couldn't just jump straight to tier four. You had to do tier one first. Then you had to do tier two was if you wanted to. And then maybe tier three. You get what I'm trying to say. So the way they worked then was maybe tier one was okay, uh, take models from this list and you get this bonus. It'd be a really easy thing to get. But tier two and tier three and tier four, that got a lot more restrictive. That was something like take at least 30 points of this type of unit or make sure you take uh, two of these or make sure whatever. It was now getting very prescriptive of what you had to put into your list. And obviously you want to be doing as many as possible because this is where you got some very powerful bonuses into your list. Uh, for one example, for one of the lists I actually enjoyed playing the most was one that was with Haley too. And in one of them, your storm striders started with all three tokens on them. And remember, this is a back in a time where they only got tokens if they got hit. So that was really important to start with those tokens. And then if you went all the way to tier four, I believe that's where they got AD. Your, your actual storm striders had advanced deployment. So these are very powerful things that you wanted to do. However, if you wanted to do them, it got more prescriptive as you went. So pretty much if you made a tier four list, 
that was it. You had to follow exactly what it said. Maybe you had a solo or something you could play with, but you're basically there. Even at tier three, you're fairly restrictive for the majority of your list. It's already preset what you have to take. And so when we look at what was good and what was bad about the way that we had things back then, and by the way, for a caster might have several different theme lists, right? If, if a caster did this in the story here and this in the story there, those would be captured by different theme lists. The good thing about that is that it was really good at trying to follow the story because it was based off of the story. And then the bad, though, is that it was very prescriptive. You had it so that this is what your list was. If you went to somebody and being like, oh, I'm running this theme list, you kind of knew what they did, right? In some cases, there was like, oh, did they go tier two or tier three? Four is ridiculous. You never do that. So there was a little bit of that. But even then, within it, you basically knew what they'd have to take. But because they had to do this for tier one, had to do this for tier two, again, it kind of built itself. And that was kind of the negative of it. Um, there was actually the opportunity where you could go out of theme, Pretty much nobody did that. Some people did. It worked in some cases. Definitely more people did it than now. But a lot of people would go in. The majority of people, I'd say, actually went into themes because those bonuses were so good to have. Let's look at Mark III now. Well, hopefully you guys know how Mark III works because that's what we're at right now. But we now are in a more general thing, right? It's not based off the caster. It's the idea of this is Storm Division. This is Sons of the Tempest. And in this, much like before, these are the units, the jacks, the solos you can take. Now it's multiple casters that can go inside of here. It's just going to slap on some special rules you get right away. And then the thing that changes is requisition options. So based on the size of the game, and that's probably something we should keep in mind too, is that these themes need to have scale in mind because we don't know what size of point game people are going to play. A lot of people assume you're playing the full normal default size, but people out there play lots of different stuff. So that has to be kept in mind with your theme power. And so the requisition points based on every 25 points, 25, 50, 75, you get a free X. Maybe it's a free solo, maybe it's a free unit, like a smaller one, um, but you're getting something free. So the good of this is that it was a lot more flexible now. There's a lot more things, you know, like even if I'm doing this same theme as somebody else, we could be doing it very differently because there's a lot more play you could be doing in that. However, the bad part of that is these, these requisition points are kind of where that prescription comes because look, if you have seven point solos and three point solos, guess which one I'm going to take? I'm going to be taking the good ones, right? So obviously we always kind of see those same handfuls of solos and then some play with all the rest of the stuff. So Right now, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there, you know, yelling at the screen. They're going to the comments or saying, well, this is better because of this or this is garbage because of that. Well, like I said, let's pump the brakes. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what our themes actually trying to achieve. What are then the metrics we should be applying to it? And then we can use that to actually say, were those old ones good or bad? And so I don't cough. Let's take a water break. All right, so there's going to be multiple things it's trying to achieve. There's not just one reason why a game has themes in it. And I think the very first one I want to start with is the story element, the feel element, the fluffy element to it. If we were to say no themes whatsoever... We're going to have factions, right? Factions is just a normal thing you see in games, right? The idea that we have Signar and Menoth and Kador. Yeah, factions is a thing you'd see regardless of themes. But if I just could take Signar and take whatever I want, the problem with that is that I'm probably just going to take the top 10%, and that's really it. And in that, let's say you might see, oh, I'm going to be taking these gun mages. Uh, I'm going to be taking these uh, trenchers here. I'm going to take these sword knights, and uh, I'm going to be take these uh, legions of lost souls. And you'll look at it, and it's just going to seem wrong, right? Um, 
first of all, there's no part in the story this really fits in. And then really honestly, seeing like a sword knight with a, a literal shield and a sword standing beside like a trencher with like a machine gun just doesn't jive. Like what what's going on here? These feel like they're from two different worlds. And so that has a reason right there from like a fluffy story perspective and just like a visual, you know, type of appreciation that if I'm looking at something that looks like it fits together and fits with the story, the narrative behind it, it just makes for a more enjoyable game in, in, in time, right? So that's one thing. But more importantly, I think to a lot of people is the game balance. How are, what is it actually doing to make this a more competitive, playable game that I can be playing with the person across from me over there? Because that's what I'm actually trying to do. If I was trying to do a story, I could make a story, but I'm here to play this game. I know there's people out there that like the story. You're awesome. That's all great. But I think more people, they're here to play the game. So how do themes make that better? Well, we already mentioned that if themes didn't exist whatsoever, well, the problem is that, again, you're going to be having that top 10%, right? When I'm looking at all the models in the range, and in War Machine, there's a lot of models, right? In other games like 40K, they'll just remake the same one, whereas here, there's always a new solo, always another unit, and we're getting that bloat of how many options we have. And when you have all these options, that means some are better than others. And sure, there's going to be things where like, well, if I try and lean and try and do this, this different thing gets better for me. Okay, that, that's fair enough. But for the most part, certain solos are going to be better than other solos and different units are going to be better than other units. And it just kind of makes sense that I'm going to be taking these powerful things. And that's not good from game design, because if that's the way that the game worked, that this is what you have, and you're going to be taking the top 10%, Lists are going to get very stagnant. And what happens when you see stagnant lists is boredom, right? Like, okay, you're playing Signar, so you took this. Same thing as always. All right, let's play this game. Yeah, yeah, I took Menoth, so I took this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, that's one of those things where it just, that monotony just gets it so that you're bored, right? You want something so that you're always looking for something new, something that, oh, what if I build it like this? Then this can beat that. Oh, but if that's now in the meta, what if I built this to counter it? And, and all these type of things is always keeping you actively thinking, actively building lists. And as we get to our next point, actively buying because it's one thing for a game balance to be like hey if we have a good balance rules where hey we have themes and so if you have different themes well if the top 10 percent was good here well now in this theme i'm going to be taking these things and man none of those were in the top 10 percent before and in this theme well these things were in the top 10%, but now these other stuff is being taken too. It now is making so that a lot more of the range of models are being used competitively. Once that happens, that whole thought engine is going to get going. And like we said, the whole wallet action is going to be going on too, because that last piece is going to be the financial. It is in Privateer Press's best interest to be having a game where you want to be buying multiple things in the range because then you're buying more stuff and spending more money. And so if we're doing themes, we're like, hey, if we just had Signar, you might not play <laughs> Tempest Blazers whatsoever. But if you're playing in Sons of the Tempest, now, now they might come in, right? You might in uh, regular just not be taking the commando, the trencher commandos whatsoever. But when you're playing in trenchers, haha, now you're playing them. Now you want to buy them. And so by doing that, the two kind of go hand in hand. Like it's really easy to look at that financial side and be like, oh, well, look at them trying to take all our money, evil capitalists. We have to realize that us as gamers can be hand in hand with that and saying, okay, we're going to make a game that's good for game balance and good for creativity and the meta is going to change as this is going to become a big thing and then you're going to have to counter it with this and we're always building new things. Lots of things are competitive. Lots of things are interesting. And as long as we have this, you're going to get your money and everything's going to work out okay. So with that in mind, our three parameters that we're looking at is the theme is there to make for a good story. 
to make it for a good game design and for, you know, that very active meta churn. And then three, to try and sell models because that's all going to be part of it too. So now what we're going to do is go back and grade some models. But like I warned, we're going to have to do another water break because I'm not going to record a sixth one of these. <clears throat> All right, so when we talk about grading at those last two ones, let's start with Mark II. So in Mark II, how did it do for the fluff, for the story? Big thumbs up. And it's a big thumbs up because obviously you would take an army from the story, from a book, and then make it on the, the table. It was just a one-to-one -one comparison. Sure, there was a little bit of flexibility, but it was a lot closer than what you got right now. K, how to do for gameplay, for that creativity, for that meta churn. That's going to be a thumbs down because pretty much all the same stuff got used. You would decide that, okay, uh, this is it's best in this area to go for tier two or tier three. That means I'm doing these things. And even though I might want to jump from this theme to that theme, and that's where the changes really happened, man, within that singular theme, things were very stagnant. And that was a problem. Which also means that when it comes to financial, thumbs down, because unless you really change things up with like, oh, but now there's this new theme with new stuff, with that one theme there, you would buy a list. It was actually a lot more common in Mark II that people would not buy factions, they would buy lists because, hey, it makes the most sense to be building this to this tier, and this is going to be my list done. And in fact, there was people that were angry that if something changed, that would have to change the way that they have their, their stuff. They're like, well, that's ridiculous, right? I, I have my list. I don't want to buy different things. Like if that's how restrictive it was that people got mad whenever you'd have to change your list. Whereas now it seems like things are changing all the time. So let's take that then and look at Mark three. How do things do for following the story? And I think we can give a general thumbs up. It's not the big thumbs up that we got before where armies were supposed to be very clearly what you saw inside the story, but it's generally there, right? So it, it's kind of covering that. How about for Metatron? That's going to be a thumbs up, right? The idea that things are going to be there and they're moving and there's a lot of different things that you can, a lot of choices you can make and the more choices you make, the more that the meta changes around it. If people are trying to counter different things, that's fantastic. And what does that mean for money? Thumbs up as well. It's probably the reason why Privateer Press did it. We could also throw in here cross themes as well. We're not going to. I did a whole separate video on that, but it's doing good financially for Privateer Press as well. As things are churning, as people are trying different things, that's going to be a thumbs up. So with that in mind, and we said that Mark II was good in one area, bad in two others, and they improved that, right? If we look from the Mark II version <clears throat> to the Mark III, things got better. And that's what you want, right? We always want continual improvement and hopefully mark four will be even better so how can we take our learnings how can we take our learnings from what mark two were and mark three and make sure that we're going to be hitting all those metrics all those you know signs of success when we get to mark four well i think what we can do when it comes to the fluffy story part is still just have things where you just group them with those general fluffy areas. Still do the thing where, hey, we're going to be having the Sons of the Tempest and the Gravedigger's Trencher type thing, right? The things where you don't want to see the Sword Knight standing by a Trencher machine gun. Okay, we're going to break those things up so that things look right together. And I don't think you need more than that, especially because we don't have the story like we used to, right? You don't have armies coming out, uh, army books rather, that have stories in them. And then from that, you can read stuff and try and build a, an army around it. That doesn't exist anyway. So it doesn't really make sense to do anything past that. Um, again, just to kind of show the, the null version where we have no themes at all. I don't feel that's going to make sense. They'll just be the mix. Of, that's just going to be a fail all the way across. We already talked about that. So because of the model range that we have, we have to group it somehow and make sure or make sense rather to group it by these larger type of elements that we have. And I think that's all we need to do. 
Now, what do we need to do for like the gameplay side, right? To really make sure that, okay, sure, from story-wise, you have these trenchers together, you have these steelheads together, whatever it is, those are kind of together in those areas. How are we going to make sure that churn is happening and that everything is always going to be um, competitive to the point that there's not an obvious way that you need to build it? Well, I don't think you need to do too much other than making sure that there's bonuses for the synergies, right? If you want to entice people to use lots of different options in there, you don't want to have a benefit saying something like, oh, uh, steelhead riflemen get armor piercing you know like if you have rules like that it just means that well what are you going to be taking oh well i'm going to be taking the rifleman right i mean when you look at Leilies, where for some reason if you take gun mages and Leilies, they get snipers like well okay i guess we're going to take them then right so you want to have special rules in there that are going to be encouraging synergy so no matter what options you take in there Things that are going to be working together. So more of a rule of like, hey, you can be having it so that your uh, steelhead riflemen can shoot through and like the, the, the halberdiers don't block line of sight. Stuff like that where it's more working them together. And then it's going to be more of a question of like, okay, well, what pieces do I want to take to make them work together? Now, Something we should address while we're getting into this is that we already said that having no themes doesn't really hit any of those parameters, right? It's, it's not really hitting the whole fluffy story part for the game mechanic. I guess things are really open, but for the most part, people are just going to go with the really top 10%, you know, the best models. I mean, like, from what you see right now, who do you see playing out a theme? Nobody. And I mean, like the one list I tried doing it was just taking the most busted stuff. All right, I'm going to take six Archons. I'm going to be taking gas before. Let's put this stuff together and make it work with, you know, like Aurora 2. You know, like it has, has to be that type of a thing. People aren't going to be just happily mixing everything up. So should there even be an option for it going out a theme? I don't think there should be, you know, and I think that's a big thing to look at for the idea of requisition points. I think requisition points are here to entice you to take a theme over not taking a theme. Um, currently, that's failing because requisition points are so powerful that you would never give up like 20 points to not be in theme. That's just ridiculous. So the idea competitively of going out of theme right now isn't really there but like we said is that something we want to encourage anyway and it seems that if like gamers found an idea of like oh you know it actually would be really good if i could mix this unit with this unit with this solo that should just be feedback that goes to the game designers and be like let's find a way to work this into the story and then actually make it for something you can actually be doing normally and build that kind of like um uh, a template later. So I actually believe you should be forced to go into themes. Figure out, okay, I'm playing Signar. These are the themes. Pick which ones you want to be going into. End of story. Now, within those themes, we already said that you're going to be have some general rules that are not making units better because you don't have to, right? There's, there's no reason to do that, right? The idea that, oh, well, this has to be better here so that if you didn't take it in theme, no, that's not even an option anymore. So you want to be encouraging synergy and taking different types of units. In fact, you might want to actually put some rules in around that, right? Like if you have three different unit types, X type of bonus is what you get, you know, something like that to try and encourage that, especially if you have lots of options. Um, but past that as well, I think it's really clear that I'm saying we don't want to be having any requisition points. I don't see what that adds whatsoever. To me, that's the one holdover that is bringing that stagnation that we saw in Mark II. Now we're seeing it here in those requisition points. They're really only there to reward you for going out of theme. Nobody's going out of theme anyway. I don't think it's even a good idea to have that as an option. So let's just get that out of here. So if we do that, what are we left with? It's actually very simple, right? We're going to take the Mark III 
themes that we have right now, strip out the requisition points, maybe look at the special rules and make sure that they're more uh, encouraging synerg overall synergies and encouraging you to, to use all the different options that you have in there. And that's really it. Is that a cop-out? Does that mean like, oh, well, here Malorian does a half-hour video talking about themes and your whole idea at the end is just to say, take out the requisition points and maybe make some uh, special rules a little bit different. Oh boy, Malorian, you're sure is very smart. Unsubscribe. You know, like, but I think that if we actually take that stop and we look at what they're trying to achieve, that's all you need to do. They don't need to be complicated. I think once you actually go and try and make them complicated, that's where they break when it comes to scaling, right? We talked about that in Mark II, where these tiers, once you took them to different size point games, they operated very differently and not in the way as intended. And so, although you could say like, well, themes should be this and that and that, I think the simpler, the better. And I think another reason for that too is that it's going to be a lot easier for game balance in the long run, right? Whenever you have these kind of like <laughs> very special rules that go in there, what that means is that you have to keep in mind for those every single time you add something to that list, right? If all we had was like these larger buckets and being like, this is the trencher bucket, anything that's a trencher is being thrown in and really try and watch the things that's going to be going over multiple. I, I think there's going to be a lot more wins here than trying to have these, you know, like super, super powerful special rules that are really making these units better and these really powerful requisition points. I mean, just to quickly talk about that one there, I've kind of heard as well, like, well, the good thing of requisition points is it makes you take solos that you wouldn't normally take. Well, that's not an answer. <laughs> if, if you weren't taking those solos because they weren't worth the points, it's because they weren't worth the points. The way to fix them and to make it so that people are taking them is to either make them better or make the points go down. That's it, you know? Or again, I sometimes I hear people say, well, the reason for the requisition points is that we want to make sure that the things that make this theme go into the theme. No, they don't. Otherwise, you'd be having things like in the trencher theme where a requisition point would be like a unit of trenchers to make it actually look like an army of trenchers. So it's not really doing that whatsoever. So let me know if you agree with that. I think that going forward, this could be, we don't even need a mark for it, right? This could be just like a dynamic update saying, look, nobody's going out of theme. We're going to just say there is no going out of theme now. You have to be in a theme. And there's no more thing you now of requisition points. If you want to be taking something, pay the points because that's how the game works, right? <laughs> For everything else, if you want it, you have to pay the points. And then I think we're just in a much better spot. I think we're in a spot that we we want to be. Uh, there's not going to be a haves and haves nots for requisition points. It's going to be hitting all the metrics that we want to be getting to. So that's what I think. Let me know if you agree. Put it down there in the video. Let me know if you have a better idea or thought maybe a little bit of a twist on something. But otherwise, we'll catch you later. Bye.